Yeah, so my name is James Edwards and I'm an International Sales Manager for Open Athens. And what today I'm going to do is I'm going to run through an introduction to Open Athens, which is going to include a demo of the end user's perspective to Open Athens, and then also an, a demo of the admin area for Open Athens, so the uh, tools and functions available to the librarians, and also a bit of a background to Open Athens and the authentication sort of um, uh, systems and services available in the current library space. Um, so a little bit on Open Athens. Um, so here's a slide saying that we you know we've been helping over 4,000 organisations enable access to hundreds and thousands of journals and databases um, for over 4 million end users across the world. And it's important to know that Open Athens isn't just about accessing sort of journals. It's also about other library services out there, so other applications that the library may have. Um, so what is Open Athens? Well, Open Athens is a, a identity and user management system, and it means that your users can access the content that the library has subscribed to. Um, without a system like Open Athens, uh, you'd have lots of barriers, as we call them, to accessing that content for the users. So these are often login screens or something similar where the user has to input information in order to gain access. This is where Open Athens would step in and it would give them just one set of credentials that they use to access all of those applications and content. However, also what's all important to remember is they also only have to access once per session. So once they've logged in once, their session stays open and they can jump between the, uh, the, your collection of applications and databases. This will enable the user to then do their job more efficiently, whether it's researching, um, looking up content for their exams, it provides them with a much more efficient service, which then should see them increase in the engagement with the library and improving the value of the library. So sort of the top five things to take from Open Athens um, is one that it's designed by librarians for librarians. So during this demo, I will show you how easy it is to use and that there is no need really for IT to be involved and that basically we are given the control to the library. And it's also, also fully hosted. So again, there's no need for something to be installed locally, which might be managed by a different team, say the IT. In this case, it's a fully hosted service. And from that means that we provide all the support that's needed and we do all the updates access, um, necessary so that every time you log in, you have the most up-to-date version of Open Athens. It also works across all devices and locations. We're not dependent on IP or anything on like that. So that means, you know, the multiple devices that people use these days, uh, Open Athens will work. All it needs is a browser and an internet connection. We are also able to collect detailed user statistics. Uh, and so this helps you see not only who's accessing what, but also which group of user uh, is accessing what type of resource. So you can get really granular with your statistics to really dig down and see how your patrons are using the library. And then there's also the side that we support user personalization. So many publisher sites these days, they offer a, a personalization sort of login option for um, users accessing their content and which I will show you later in the demo, and we can work with that to log them in. So why is Open Athens being adopted globally? Well, as I sort of mentioned, you know, the user patron requirements are changing all the time. Now, mobile access is key. Users are trying to access content from anywhere. There's no longer you go to a library, sit down, log into a computer and access from there. Now they want to be able to access whilst on the move, whilst traveling from any country. And so with Open Athens, this makes it very possible. And as a so personalization is also expected. On all sort of social sites and entertainment things now, you get your personalization mentioned. So on Netflix, you'll get recommendations on what you should watch due to what you've seen before. Uh, and when you're shopping, similar um, experiences like that. And users want this. And then and publishers are doing that now on their sites. And we can work with that, as I mentioned. And also, users now have multiple devices. They're carrying mobile phones, tablets, laptops, whatever it may be. We have to have a system that will work with all of these devices to enable the user to access the content when they want, where they want. There's also the site of security. Security is now a very hot topic and, uh, and very important um, to libraries, IT, and organizations as a whole. So many new sort of systems have been um, standards have been adopted. Um, so you've got HTTPS, 
which is done by most publishers now. Uh, and then you've also got the certificates that constantly need to be updated. And when you're using uh, uh, proxy versions, this can be involving a lot of work and taking up a lot of your time as you have to keep updating all of the standards and making sure that these connections stay working and they do not break. There is also the site of dynamic web pages where you've got no static HTML links for the proxies to work with as the HTML link will constantly change and the wording will change throughout. There's also the side when you come to dynamic IPs as well, where IPs are changing too. And this makes IP proxy recognition very difficult. Um, and it's all in the name of trying to improve the security uh, and um, improving basically how users are accessing that content securely. So, and there's also the side that librarians have a lot more to do these days. There are far more tech services available to librarians. You've got uh, virtual learning environments, discovery services. And there's also the side that multiple tech services must integrate with everything as well. There's no point having all these different systems and tools and having the user having to log in to each single one when actually there's a system out there where we can connect it all together so they works all seamlessly. Also, libraries will want to uh, monitor their engagement. They want statistics to show how important the library is and improve and show the value of the users accessing that library content to see the results it gains. And Open Appins provides you with these options. One of uh, a key area is an academic report, which was to show that um, the library use increased with student success. So what they wanted to show was that students who use the library in some way would achieve a higher grade when, and, and academic success than the students who did not use the library. Now, you know, people want to prove this with the stats to do it, and there is one group that did that, which is the uh, Kensaw State University. And they went ahead and looked at their proxies, their easy proxy logs from over se seven semesters and ended up with uh, nine million rows of data. Now, as you imagine, managing through this, this whole system, it took time, you know, a lot of resource went into it to prove this statistic. And what I will show you later with the Open Athens is that we can now do that in just a simple click of a button. It didn't need, you know, months and months of researching and going through that data. We can now just do all of that at a click of a button. And that's due to the technology that Open Athens has with its federated access. There's also RA21. So I don't know if you've come across RA21 before, but this is resource access for the 21st century. And these organizations have got together and they've come up with a solution, that, well, well, not a solution yet, but they're trying to come up with somewhere because they've come up to the understanding that publishers, libraries, and consumers have come to the understanding that authorizing, authorizing access to content based on IP address no longer works today in this distributed world. Um, that's because IP was never originally designed for the purpose it is serving here with being as a way of authorizing users to content. It has just been sort of ad uh, adapted and, and adopted by the industry and it has for many years, but now it's not really working. Um, so please go visit ra21.org to see the discussions going on there, to uh, see yeah what other solutions are there for us. And it's all a large of it related to federated access. So when I'm going on about how Open Athens works versus proxy, um, here is just a quick slide to show you. Um, the federated is basically a SAML handshake that's going on. And from there, you can see you've got multiple users coming up where that authentication process is happening. Information is being passed over, which identifies not just that where that user's from, but who they are. And then this gives them the two-way transparency with the publisher, so the publisher can see those individuals as well. With IP or a proxy, you've got those same mass group of users accessing that content, but they get funneled down into sort of one user, you could say, an anonymous user. And so from that, the publisher only knows where they're from, not actually the individual themselves. Um, this slides and everything will be available to you after the webinar for you to have a look at again and share. So what is Access Federation? So I don't want to bore you too much with the technical details, so I'll keep this brief. But, but essentially, federations consist of two entities, the service provider here on the left and the identity provider. Service providers 
uh, the, the vendors that we all subscribe to. So in this case, you've got Science Direct, Ovid, JSTOR, and Sage. And the identity providers, they are you. They are the libraries, the institutions who subscribe to the service providers. Now, without a federation in place, um, the, uh, as you can see, without the federation in place, you would have to make a connection from each one of these. So each identity provider will connect to each service provider. And as you can see, you end up with a crisscross and mad lattice of lots of different connections going on with all these individual ones. Now that just gets very complicated. And if one of these was to say break, say Science Direct broke, every then identity provider has to go in and correct that connection to make it rework. And this obviously means a lot of time for everyone. And it's, you know, it takes up uh, a lot of your library's time. When a federation comes in, what happens is the service providers are connecting to that federation along with the identity providers. And in this case, if something was to change from Science Direct, they would tell the federation, the Open Athens Federation, we would then change that. And there's no need for the identity providers to then make any changes on their side. So that is kind of the federation in a, in a nutshell. Um, and yes, there's far more to we can talk about that. One of our colleagues here, uh, she wrote this book on access to online resources. Uh, and it's for the modern librarians. And in there, she'll go into that into more detail and also other ways of accessing um, content in this in today's world. So please go there and access it and you can download your free copy of that book if you would like to know more. So now let's see Open Athens. I'm now going to jump in and show you Open Athens from an end user's perspective. So bear with me now whilst I just show, close my screen and bring up the web browser. Okay, so what I will be showing you is a customer of ours based out in Australia. They are the Clinical Knowledge Network and they are the healthcare provider of, in the area of Queensland. Now, obviously, I'm off-site. I'm not in Australia. I'm here in the UK. So this will be an off-site demo, but Open Athens can work very similar on-site and off-site as that is what we provide, access for your users wherever they may be. Now, there are a number of ways users will access content. Um, in this case, the Clinical Knowledge Network, they like to push their users through to their library portal, and from there, they can then access the different subscriptions that the library has. So that's the way I'm gonna show you this way. Um, so here, I've been given the, my login details. Now, I'll show you later how you can create Open Athens credentials. But this is the page where I will now log in and start my Open Athens session. So what will happen now is once I've logged in, an Open Athens token or cookie, if you like, will now open up in this browser session and it will stay open for eight hours. So from here now, I can jump between all the different content without the needs of having to log in again. Now the CKN library page here, they have a you know, discovery tool here. They've also got quick links to their most used resources. So they've got lots of ways in which they get their users to engage with the content. I'm just gonna show a, sort of a, a standard way in which users might access content. So for in this case here, I'm gonna use the discovery service. I'm gonna search for uh, something related to eyes as that's what I'm researching. What you'll see now is I'm now jumping away from that library page to the third party discovery service. And it will authenticate me through and it will search the databases for the term I've asked for. So as you can see here now, it's gone through, it's brought up the relevant content related to what I wanted. What I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna find one that is away from the discovery service and not have the PDF full text there. So in this case here, I click on this link, it's gonna bring up where I can find the full text article on the effects of early eye removal. In this case, there's a clinical key. And what you're gonna see now is our redirect to kick in, which is again, something I'll show you later. The URLs at the top here are going to change very quickly as it picks up the redirector, so that go.openappens.net, then on my open app in session, it takes me to Elsphere, says, yes, we know who you are, where you're from, and it pushes me through to Clinical Key and that full text article. So from there, now you can see I've got access to this. Now, one of the key differences here, you'll see the top left, they know where I'm from, but in the top right here, 
there is also my name, and that's the user personalization I mentioned earlier. Now, you can't get this using a proxy IP. This works due to the way in which Federated Access can identify the individual users. And from this personalization, I have my saved searches, my search history, and also I can also have my favorite content saved underneath. So here I've got content I've looked at earlier. So here was another journal I looked at. I can click on that and it will take me straight through to that full text article as well. So that's showing you, you know, how useful that personalization can be to your users uh, and that they can have all that, you know, important and stuff they've looked at before they can find it easily and save it on their on their personalization pages now just to show you how you know you can access other other ways so from the library page here i can start accessing these other databases too um, i can do it via the discovery service as well and this would also show you that every publisher site is different so as these are just authenticating me through, here we are, we're going to the Embase. You can see I've gone through, Embase offer that personalization. I'm logged in at the top there. There we go, James Edwards. I'm now logged in. I can search there for any content I'm after. Micromedics here, IBM Micromedics. Um, they don't have that personalization, but I'm logged in. So it's logged out there. So I'm logged in. I can now search away for any content I'm after. And same with MIMS online. There we go. They know where I'm from. I'm logged in there and yeah, I'm, I'm good to go. So from there, you can see at the start, I logged in and from that now I've gone to five or six different sort of journals and databases, which I would have had originally logged in without Open Athens to each and every one of those. But with Open Athens, it just pushes you through seamlessly to each of those content. So that's one way in which the users are going to be jumping between content. They also, you know, might go via Google if they were say, you know, they've been on Science Direct and that's where they want to go straight to. At this stage, Science Direct, you know, there's no link involved in this from the library page saying who I am or where I'm from. So I'm going to have to sign in. So I click sign in. Open Athens. And what will happen now is it will pick up my Open Athens session and log me in to Science Direct. And that's due to the fact that there was no, as I said, mentioned, no use, no sort of Open Athens redirect or anything in links going to it. It was just straight to Science Direct. But as you see, it picks up that Open Athens session when I click sign in and logs me in. If this was the very first thing I did, so as a user, I turned on my PC, went online and went straight to Science Direct, and I clicked log in by Open Athens, I would then have to search for my institution. And from that, I would be directed to my institutional login page, and then it will take me back to Science Direct. And then away I go, my Open Athens session has begun. So I hope that's clear on how Open Athens looks to the end user. Ideally, they don't really see much happening. That's the way we like it. They are just going seamlessly from content to content uh, and accessing all they want as quickly and smoothly as possible. So now I'm going to jump in to the admin area of Open Athens. So again, as I said, Open Athens, it's fully hosted. As you see everything here, all I need is an internet connection and a browser to access all of our services. So bear with me now as I log in to the admin area. I will show you two admin areas. One will be for the CKM, so you can see their statistics. And then I'll also show you from um, the uh, demo area of how the connections are made within the admin area. Now, for, I'll start off with the stats side, um, as you know, so you can get an idea of what that looks like and how you can use that at your organisation. Bear with me here. And so now you should hopefully be able to see the dashboard for the stats at CKM. Now on this homepage here, it gives you a good overview of what's been happening with your account. So you've got the top resources, and you can change that down from the last seven days, 30 days, 24 hours. That's up to you how you want to look at that. You've also got the total authentications over the last seven days, et cetera. And then there's also the heat map of the globe here to show actually where your users are accessing 
um, your collection from. Um, so this will be really helpful to show you the sort of global reach maybe your organization has and the importance of it across the globe to all your users. All of this is also you know, interactive. You can click on these links and it will take you to that information. So let's have a look here at the top resources. This now takes you to a graph view and showing you the, to the total use of your resources over this set, in this case here, the last month. Um, let's just have a look at all organizations. So this is every account within the clinical knowledge network. This is showing you that total usage. You can then break this down into the individual resources. So in this case here, you've got EBSCO Information Services. I can see from the totals, it's the most popular. And you can see how much of a percentage of the usage that resource takes up. And you can then look at it individually. So let's pick a day here. So we've got Wednesday, the 29th of August. There was a total of 1,162 um, accesses to, the to your resources, of which of that EBSCO Information Services was 298. But then also you've got this dotted line here, and that's telling you unique users. So that's telling you that 160 actual users did use the EBSCO Information Services, and it was used 298 times. And what does that map you can you know, gather from that is you can see if you have any sort of like super users who may be using your, your library resources a lot, uh, or if actually you've got a thing where it's going out to a large number of users who are actually using the library, you know, a small number of times. And so it doesn't then skew your results because you might get statistics now which show that this resource is the most popular, but actually is it, or is it just really popular by one user? So if you did lose that resource, how big an impact would that have on your library? With these statistics, you can then start gathering that information to see, well, this resource is used by a large majority of people. This one is used a lot by, by just a small number. We can then also look at this by job role. So CKN here, they have different groups of users. They've got nurse, midwife, the registrar, the pharmacist, and from that, you hear, you can see how they are using your, the library resources. Um, so again, and this is looking at the last month. We could go back, you can change these dates. You can go back two months, three months. You can then look at it daily, hourly, monthly. All of this is very customizable to suit the needs that um, are required by the library. And if this is looking at all resources, we could then look at an individual resource. So we know that EBSCO, was a very popular one. Let's go on to that. And again, we can now see those groups accessing that resource. So you can actually see which group of users are accessing which resources. Uh, and what that may mean now is you can then start looking at which ones are the most important to which groups of users. You might have an enterprise subscription to a certain resource when actually you realize it's only used by a certain group of users. So why not then renegotiate that so that actually you get a subscription for you know, a less number of people to access it. And that's where you can start using these reports. It's to really, I mentioned, show the value of the library and who uses the resources the most and, and all of that to then gain a much better understanding of your users and the content you subscribe to. All these reports can be saved and then emailed to you monthly. So there's no need to come in here and actually pull the report each time. You can just have it appear in your inbox to then go away and use as you like. You can also download all the data that's required. So you can then display that however you may want to um, to the relevant members. Um, so that's the reporting and the stats side to Open Athens. Now what we'll do is go and have a look at how you can create a user and add those to your account. So for this, I'll be using a demo area of ours, and it will show you the different um, functionalities and connections available to Open Athens. So again, as you'll see, this is using it from just the browser, and this is the home page of your admin area. So at the top here, you've got a link to the statistics that I just showed you. Um, and it also just gives you a brief overview of what's been happening on your account. There's not much been happening here. There's very few users in this account. Um, but what I will show you now is how you get those users into your account. 
Now, the most common way we're seeing uh, these days is that we're connecting to an existing user directory. Um, this has the added benefit of a true single sign-on experience for your users. And this is done simply here. We go to Management, Connections. Here we've got the local authentication and you'd click Add. And these are the different connections we have. Um, ADFS is the most common one we often come across. You know, it's the Microsoft Active Directory. And this is in place in many, area, in many institutions. And so we see that connection happening a lot. But we've also got the CAS, um, there's LDAP in there as well. And But any really thing that uses the SAML technology, we should be able to connect with. So once you've had that and made your, looked at your connection, in this case here, we go for the ADFS. This is what that connection will look like. Now it looks quite complicated, but most of this will be input normally, uh, sorry, automatically. The only really key bit of information for us is this unique user attribute. And this is just something that can identify your users. So in this case here, we have email address, but it could be a student ID, it could be a public library um, membership number, um, anything that is, yes, going to identify that user uniquely. Um, for when these connections take place, there is often a little bit of IT involvement, um, but this is once it's set up and running, there's no need for it from then on. And when we come to that unique user attribute, you can also release even more to us. So in this case here, on this one here, we've got a first name, a last name, that email address, but we've also got department in there. Uh, and you can add as many of these as you like, and this is just information that you want to release to us and then on to the publishers. And this is where you then get that information to, to report on what you want. So for example, with CKN, you had job role, so they would have a job role attribute in there. And then, although you can use this, this information to report and get statistics on, you can also use it to group your users to allow access and restrict access to certain groups of users. And this is where we come into our permission sets. So here we've got permission sets, and this is where you would create a, a set of users who can have access to certain content. So what you do is you just create a new permission set here with a rule. So let's say you wanted your alumni to have access to certain content, but not to your whole collection. All you do is you do a rule name, give it as so alumni, you would have your department, which was that attribute. And when that matches, let's say you'd call it alum in your active directory, your user directory, when it matches that, you apply your alumni permission set. So you'd have to have that created. And so what you're saying then is every user that has that term where the department matches a lumen, they will then fall into that group. And then to add a resource to that group, you just go to our resource catalog. And so here, what we say with our resource catalog, these are all the resources that work with Open Athens. Now, as you can see here, there is a proxy. Now, we appreciate that you know federated access is the way we would rush to go, and that's what we primarily will use. But not every publisher out there works in a federated manner. They still use IP. And so for that, we have a managed proxy as part of our service. And this is just to enable us to still work with that wide range of vendors. But let's pick one now that we want to add to that group. So let's say it's 4D Anatomy. You would then just click on here, click to allocate. It will then list all those permission sets you've set up. You want it for the group alumni. You'd update that allocate, allocation, and then that's done. So this is where you would find, you'd come in, you've got your subscription in place, you'd find that subscription in our catalog, and then you'd allocate it to those relevant permissions, permission sets. And that is how you can then restrict access to certain groups of users, enabling you to have a much wider um, sort of range of content um, to all your users. From that, as I did mention earlier, the redirector, this is where you can also do the redirector link. So at the moment, you know, when you're using a proxy, um, you would have a sort of a proxy prefix in front of a URL. This is working similar to that, but we've tried to make it much more simpler for you. 
Um, in order to create a redirector link, we have this prefix that will go in front of the URL. And so you are just coming here, you would put in the address you want to go to. So in this case, it's going to be Science Direct. And you click Generate Link. And in there, it creates that link for you. It's telling you where the, um, you know, where it's part of. So it's part of the Elsevier products. And then it will do create this encoded link for you, which you can then go away and test. Now, we've also got a way in which you can use multiple URLs for that. In this case here, you would just put a, a CSV file or text file with the list of all of your URLs, and you'd upload that into the system, and then this would encode all those links for you. So if you were to set up Open Athens and you had a list of all your links and you're implemented to our service, we can do this system very quickly for you um, with this handy tool. So again, it's all about making this system for librarians and which they can come in here and do all this themselves in a very easy manner. And that's, yeah, so that's the redirector. And that is so when you have that service, those links on your library page, it will take the users straight to the content in an easy manner. Now, the other way for which Open Athens may work is you don't have users in your user directory or you may not have a user directory to connect to. In that case, you can use Open Athens as your directory. Um, for that, you would need to create the account. And if you go to the home page, you've got this add account widget here. If you click on that, this you can then use to create an individual user. So this might be handy if you've got people who are coming to say your institution, they're only gonna be there for two weeks, you maybe have contractors, um, and they're not gonna be in your actual institution or organization directory. Here you can just create them a single Open Athens account, which then they can then use for that set amount of time. You just follow this wizard through, select what, you're allowed, what they're allowed to access, and then they'll get sent an email with an activation link, and they click on that link like most other social media sites work and, and um, membership signups, they click that link and off they go. Now, there might be a case where you've got more than one or two users coming at once. We also have a bulk upload function. And in this case here, you would download a bulk template, which is our Excel sheet. And from that, you just put in their first name, last name, and email address. And then it will send all of those users an activation link and away they go. And you can do hundreds to thousands of users in one go with that system. So that is sort of the first, you know, the introductory to Open Athens. Um, hopefully you can see just how simple it is to use. Um, you know, it is what I'm saying, giving control back to the library and also showing, you know, getting really good results and statistics from your usage and actually using that to help get a much better understanding of your users and how they are engaged with the library. So now I'm going to open up to any questions that have come through and I believe Blake's been looking at the questions. Yeah that's it there's been a number come through so far so the first one is what will prevent users from sharing their usernames and passwords? Uh, it's a good question I mean at the end of the day there is you know we cannot stop that that is sadly, that's a user error. Um, the only thing is, is if you are connected to a, you know, a local directory, when they give that username and password, they are also, whoever they're giving it to, they are giving it access to a whole lot more information about them. So, you know, that's user error, but we, you know, we can only do so much to stop the user doing that. Okay, and next, how does Open Athens get the user data from the identity provider if there is no involvement from campus IT? So, so sorry, repeat that question. How does Open Athens get the user data from the identity provider if there is no involvement from campus IT? Um, so in that case, we would need a list of the users. Um, the librarian will obviously have to collate that list and they can use that managed directory system where they would bulk upload them into Open Athens. That's right. Okay, it sounds like the vendor needs to be it sounds like the vendor needs to support Open Athens or at least the underlying technology it uses. For subscriptions and vendors who don't support it, it sounds like we would still need to rely on easy proxy or some other option. Is that correct? That's not correct. No, we, within Open Athens, we do have 
a managed proxy. And that is for those vendors that currently do not support federated access. So we should be able to replace um, your current proxy solution. Um, there would be obviously a discovery stage that we would go through with, um, with the prospect to see actually how each one of your resources would work with Open Athens. Okay. Uh, so there is another question here that says, would it be possible for you to show the initial login again for the CKN institution? Um, so it says to bring up the web page or the CKN library web page. I think they just. Certainly, yeah, no problem. Let me jump back to that. Okay, bear with me. So I'm just going to close down my browser because obviously I have the session in. Okay, so I'll start up a new browser. I'm going to go straight to that CKN homepage. So yep, so this is their homepage with the login box. And so they have obviously um, embedded this login session onto that page. Is there anything else? Uh, yeah, there's a few more questions. So, um, can you view statistics at individual user individual user level? Um, so we can. That was in the um, old statistics. So I said that module I showed you was the new one, and so there are still some new updates that we have to release to actually show that happening now. Um, but I can happily go through that with you um, directly um, at a later date following this webinar. Oh, and there's some, there's some more that have just recently come in. What databases are already implemented? I mean, databases, providers, or publishers? Okay, yep, yeah, for that, so I'll show you now. If you go to openathens.net, and from this openathens.net page, the bottom left here, we have Open Athens resources. I click that from here you've got a list of all of the resources and how they work with open Athens. so these are our enabled services there's a search top here and then it you can also filter down by how they work with open Athens. so whether they are federated or using the proxy Brilliant. does open Athens have methods to prevent massive downloads to a resource which is a common problem using proxy method so yes, we, we have various um, ways of monitoring use. Um, that can be whether how, where the user logs into. So there's various, if they log into three different um, countries, for example, in a certain time, it will shut down the account. Uh, but also to manage that individual download, that will be done by the, the publisher themselves. When you're using a proxy service, obviously they will have to shut down that whole organization because they won't know who it is. Luckily, if they're using federated access, which is why it's so popular, especially with the publishers themselves, is they can identify that single account that might be hitting that download limit. So they can just shut off that one user rather than the whole organization. And then they can come to you and say, this account has been, you know, we've seen over the normal usage, and then you can research it from there. Okay, and the same person that asked the, <clears throat> the question about which databases are available asked, and um, so they said, for example, in Latin America, Colombia, we have resources like Cielo, Doage. Um, is it easy to configure or develop the connection between Open Athens and the publisher? Um, so from the identity side, um, then I showed you once they're part of our federation or our, an enabled service of Open Athens, then yes, it was just simply once you've set up that subscription with that user, that provider, you then just click there and click that allocate button that I mentioned and give it to the permission sets you want. Uh, if you're talking about a new vendor becoming an enabled service, then that is a separate conversation that again, we can follow up with the right contacts after this webinar. Excellent. And lastly, what will prevent? Oh no, I've read that one. Um, I work for a commercial. <clears throat> I work for a commercial organisation. Can we still use the Open Athens service? Yes, Open Athens is available um, across. Um, yes, all different sort of markets. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you, James and Blake, for both parts of the webinar. And um, yeah, there, there'll be a follow-up email tomorrow going out um, with a link to the recording. Um, and details um, of James so you can get a hold of him if you require any more information. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us and please do get in touch if you need anything else. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.